Okay, so... Um, so the chain rule, again, this is an instance in which uh, we really didn't have to use it because that wasn't very difficult to expand, so no big deal. Uh, but we did verify there that uh, in order to balance out those two uh, derivatives, that that extra factor of three that came from the derivative of that inner function of composition was required. Um, but let's look at some cases where that can't be done. So here's some um, uh, more examples of functions that are treated through the chain rule. Uh, in particular, each case we do have an operator that we've actually looked at under, uh, under other conditions. Uh, this is, uh, again, a power function, fifth power. But now it's not just x that's being raised to the power, but it's a function of x itself. Uh, same thing here. We've looked at the square root, right? We took the derivative of the square root on the quiz today. Uh, but this is not just the square root of x. It's the square root of something more complicated. This is the square root of uh, a function of x. And the same thing here. We've already treated the cosine function. We know what its derivative is, but this is not the cosine of the variable. It's the cosine of some function applied to the variable. So in each one of these cases, the, the uh, fundamental laws that we've already analyzed for these cases aren't sufficient because it's no longer the variable that's coming under the operator, but something more complicated. And so let's, uh, let's do it again. Let's apply the chain rule to these examples. Um, part A. What's the derivative? Uh, so, uh, once again, uh, I've got to break this down. Uh, y is the result of, uh, or y can be considered the result of some function of composition. Uh, so in this case, what would the component functions be? f of x, the outside function is what? The fifth power. That's the last operation in sequence, so that's the last thing I do. And once I've identified that outside function, then it's pretty obvious what the inside has to be. It's whatever the fifth of power is being applied to. So the fifth power was applied to the function 3x squared minus 15. Okay. Uh, and now I'm going to need those two derivatives. I'm going to need the derivative of f, and I'm going to need the derivative of g. Those are going to be part of the uh, derivative of the composition. The derivative of f is what? 5x to the fourth. And the derivative of g so the derivative here and then the constant goes to zero. So the square, the derivative of the square is 2x and that 3 that sits out front now, according to the rule, well, uh, according to the rule, the derivative here is going to be what? Um, well, just to remind you, it's f prime evaluated at g times g prime. So the formula for g now is going to go into f's derivative. So what used to be that thing to the fifth power is now 5 times that thing to the fourth power. So there's the first term, or first factor. All I did was I replaced the x in the formula for the derivative with the formula for g in the same way that the composite function is the substitution of g in place of x in its form. And then the second factor, 6x. So the first factor here from this, and this factor and back from that. And then I will simply, oh, and by the way, this is a case where I really do need this chain rule. Uh, that's a very difficult thing to expand. It's possible. I could expand that out. I could do the binomial to the fifth power, but that's a very complicated thing to do. Um, so simplest way and uh, in the advantage, not only that, but the advantage is that the result will be in factored form. And for some of the questions that we ask about these results, that factored form is what we really want. Uh, but I do have two things that can be combined. I've got this factor out front and this factor in back. Those two guys are outside of the scope of the exponent. So those two can be brought together. So in the end, that's what I get. So part of that was just taking the fifth power, moving it out front, and then reducing the exponent by one. Part of the result includes that, 
but there's a little bit more, that little extra factor that came from that derivative of that inside function. Okay, uh, in the second one, how do I take this apart? If I'm looking at f here as a function of composition, what's inside and what's outside? So the square root is the last thing that's on the outside. On the inside, uh, the whatever, uh, 2x plus 1. Okay, so that's how uh, the big function came about. Um, but I now need those two derivatives. Uh, this is the easy one. What's the derivative of g? That's easy. Uh, and then the derivative of the square root. Uh, we had this problem on the quiz today, um, but I'll go ahead <coughs> and remind you where that comes from. Um, how do I take the derivative of the square root? What's the trick? We look at it as a power function. So the square root represents the one-half power. And according to our power rule, one-half x to the minus one-half. So the old exponent comes out front as the multiplier, and the new exponent is one less than the old one. And finally, I can put this back into uh, reciprocal form, in a radical form, by using the negative power. So now the square root, right, the one-half power, that's the square root and the negative. Uh, so that's how that works. So f prime is the reciprocal of twice the radical. And now I'm ready to take the derivative of the big function. After the composition has been completed, the derivative comes from f prime evaluated at the old function g. So now the old function g that used to be under the radical, the simple square root, now is going to be mo it's going to move. The new function, 1 over twice the square root, and g takes its place under the radical. And then when I'm finished with all that, I've still got that extra factor that comes from g's derivative. So this piece here, that's f prime composed with g, and this factor here, that's g prime. And finally, I've got some cancellation. This factor of 2 that came from the derivative of g, and this factor of 2 that came from the power function's derivative, uh, those will cancel. And so all I have left is this piece. So once again, it worked out exactly like I anticipated, that one-half power, reciprocal of the radical from the power rule, but that extra factor of one-half got canceled away because I had that factor of g's derivative that I had to account for. So now that one-half that came from the power rule is gone. And then finally, the last one here, cosine of 2 theta. Um, if it was cosine of theta, this would be easy because we have a rule for the single variable. Uh, this is double angle, so I'm going to have to look at this as a function of composition. Um, f of g, how do I take that apart? Uh, f of theta and g of theta, uh, the out, uh, well, let's look at the inside out. That was the inside function of composition here, 2 theta, and that leaves cosine theta for the outside. So that's where big F came from. It came from this 2 taking the place of that theta. What's the derivative of cosine? Oh, and by the way, now I am taking the derivative of just plain cosine. Once I've isolated that cosine function as the outer function of composition, now it is just cosine theta that I'm actually applying the derivative to. And I have a law for that. That's one of our basic fundamental differentiation rules. It's derivative of cosine theta, negative sine. So that's where that comes in. 
and g prime is what? Two. So constant function. Okay, and once again, this is going to work out in exactly the same way. H prime is going to end up being the derivative of the outer function, evaluated at the inner function, and that result is going to be multiplied by the derivative of the outside function. So uh, in the formula for sine, now 2 theta goes in place in exactly the same way that it took the place of the theta in cosine, the original function. <coughs> and the extra factor of 2 that came from G's derivative. So that, and this is exactly what we had anticipated. The derivative of cosine is minus sine, so I still get minus sine of the original argument, but I also get that extra factor. And in the normal, in the usual sense, we always put those coefficients out front, so I would move the minus 2 sine 2 theta would probably be the way this would be written in practice, or should be. Okay, so there's some simple examples of how the chain rule can be applied to these specific instances. Um, um, let's look at a couple of more complicated cases. Look at this one. So I've got a power function involved here. But the scope of the power includes uh, not just a variable, but some complicated expression that involves a variable. And uh, I've also got this quotient here, a function that is quotient form. So uh, right away I can see that there's going to be two of our uh, more complicated laws that are going to be involved here. I've got a function of composition, and I've got a quotient. So both those rules are going to have to be applied. Let's see here. Um, Let's break it down, outside and inside. f of x is what? So the outside function is the power. That's the last thing that I would do in sequence. Um, the derivative, I'll need that in a minute, so I'll go ahead and do that, 3x squared. And the inside function of composition is what? Everything else. 1 minus 2x over... 1 plus x. And now to find g's derivative, got to use quotient rule. So uh, with now I'm going to have to go in here and look at this as a um, quotient of functions. I'll call this top function u of x. I'll call this bottom function v of x. Um, u's derivative is what? And V's derivative is what? Okay, so now the quotient rule applied to that inner function. So let's see, what do we get? A G prime of X is equal to the derivative of the numerator, so that's negative 2, multiplied by the denominator, so 1 plus X. Then I subtract. Uh, the, d the numerator function multiplied by the derivative of the denominator. So the denominator's derivative is 1. And all of that over the square of the original denominator. So there's our quotient rule being applied. And now I simplify. Negative 2 minus 2x minus 1 plus 2x And these two cancel. And so in the end, what do I have? Up on top, minus 3. And I guess I should put the minus out front since the, like that. Is that right? Okay, so that's a lot of work just, just for that part. Uh, but we're not finished. I've still got to um, uh, go back to the chain rule and apply the appropriate values in the appropriate place. So f prime f prime of g. So I need the 
uh, derivative of f evaluated at g, the original function g. So that would be this guy here put in place of that guy there. So the derivative uh, of y uh, would look like this. Um, 3 times the original function g, the quotient function raised to the second power. So there's that part of it. This piece represents the derivative of f evaluated at g. And then multiplied by the result of the chain rule, or the quotient rule that I just used to obtain that result. Yes, this should be 3. Be a 3 here. All right, good. All right. I don't have it right. Uh, okay, so, uh, and there's the other component of the chain rule. There's the uh, derivative of that inside function. Okay, but now the question becomes, how does this simplify? Uh, would I just leave it like that, or would I take it further? Um, well, the one thing that these two fractions share are those uh, factors of 1 plus x. So it would be appropriate to combine all of that. And I've got a couple of constants running around here. I got this constant factor of 3 here, got this constant factor of 3 out front. Those two should be brought together. So I'm going to do this in a couple of steps. Uh, the two 3's, 3 times 3, that's 9. Um, and the I would bring, drag the negative along, right? That was a negative 3 if I look at it in the normal way. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to do a couple of things. Uh, for the uh, first fraction factor, I'm going to go ahead and distribute that, not, uh, that uh, exponent. So the square of the fraction is the fraction of the squares. And then I've still got this extra uh, factor of 1 plus x that has to work itself into that. And so in the end, I can combine these two fractions into one, and that denominator will have the um, uh, common factor of one, uh, a multiple, an exponential of the original 1 plus x denominator. So in simplest form, 9 here, 1 minus 2x squared here, and 1 plus x to the what? 4. So 2 plus 2 is 4. Um, so that would be the simplest form. And again, this is very advantageous for us. If we're going to answer the usual sorts of questions that we ask about derivatives, then this factored form is much more informative or much more useful than that unsimplified form. But there we go. Uh, okay, so here's an example of, uh, you know, we had to apply two of our more complicated rules chain rule because of the composition and then the quotient rule because that inside function was rational function in that sense. Um, let's do another one. Okay, so step one, this is pretty straightforward. It's not, again, we've, been, uh, we've done this a few times now. I've got a composition that involves the power function and um, applied to something more complicated, so the usual thing. Uh, in this case, uh, f of x is going to be what? x cubed. Oh, just like before. And so we, we've already done that, right? f prime is going to be 3x squared. Okay, so there's that piece. <coughs> what does that leave over for the inside function? Well, the inside function's got all the rest of it. Okay. Good, good. Okay, so now uh, I've got f's derivative, I've got the composition, the only thing left, g's derivative. Okay, what's the derivative of g? Well, what's the derivative of the first term? One. Uh, but now I've got a new issue. The derivative of the second term is going to require what? Chain rule. 
So here's an example of multiple applications of the chain rule. Um, the inner function of composition itself contained a function of composition. Uh, so it's not at all unusual to see these uh, chain rules being compounded <coughs> uh, depending on how the original composition has been constructed. <coughs> so I guess I'll do this one separately. Uh, if I take this guy here and look at this function comp of composition, <coughs> how does this function come about? And I guess I've already used f and g, so I guess I'll use u and v again. <coughs> if this function is a result of a composition, what are the inside and outside functions? And inside... So I'll need the uh, derivatives of the component functions. 